Okay, so let's get started. Um, hello everyone, my name is Arnab. Um, I know it's a little bit hard to pronounce. I'm from Moz, and uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about potential integrations uh, between the Mesos and the networking stack, and what can it look like, what are some open challenges. Um, essentially, this is more of an overview and, uh, and this kind of motivational talk rather than saying, here is something cool, unfortunately. So as an outline, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about why we should be talking about these things. Why is it anyway even interesting? A uh, little bit of a very, very brief history of how networks have evolved. Um, then we're gonna look at um, the integration, what can potentially integration between the network and the Mesos look like? Um, some open questions and then conclusions. So with that, so today, when you look at the way applications and networks interact, it's essentially to the applications, the network is a pipe, it is essentially a magical dump pipe. You, know, you shove, you say, I want to send data to this endpoint, you get a handle, you shove bytes into that endpoint, and they appear on the other end magically. Coincidentally, uh, to the networks, all apps look pretty much the same. They're all um, sources of bytes, uh, um, data sources and sinks. So while there is a lot of data communication that's happening between this layer, in terms of actual cooperation and coordination, um, there's sort of kind of this brick wall. Um, so if you think about it, the both ends have a common goal. Uh, basically, both ends wants, wants to want to have efficient uh, communication, and both sides bring a pretty different but complementary worldview to the table. Apps know their intent really well, so they know this is exactly how I want to communicate, this is who I want to communicate with, uh, but they can't really inform or change the network very much, yes, you can put in QoS bits and somehow influence uh, the network, but you can't really change that very much. On the other hand, the network really knows about how is the connectivity being realized, what's happening uh, at the actual transmission or at the actual uh, data communication layer, but it's really hard for the network in most cases to be able to divine the app intent very easily. So, a brief show of hands, how many of you here are networking folks? Okay, so a lot of them. Um, so as a disclaimer, pretty much everything I say is gonna be wrong in one way or the other, and what I mean is not that you know it's actually wrong, what I mean is every statement I make is there are gonna be exceptions and cases where it's not true. The intent here is to sort of kind of highlight some of the key points rather than actually be pedantically correct. And the good thing is for all the networking folks, the next section is gonna be very, very elementary. It's been a long day, it's tiring, so if you wanna take a nap, this is the time to do it. So a very brief and incorrect, as I said, a tour of the network evolution. How did the networks evolve? So in the earliest case, in the earliest networks, you basically had a single LAN, which is you had a set of nodes connected to one hub, and the, the network was broadcast based, and what that means is uh, any, any communication that happens, anything you put on the network is seen by everybody else. Uh, the, all the hardware is at the layer two, which is the Mac, uh, which is the data link layer, and, and, but you still have IP at this stage. So, one immediate question that arose is actually how do I how do, how does IP how does IP addressing work? How do I find uh, a given L2 address to which I should send stuff if I actually want to send uh, something to an L3 address? The answer is uh, pretty much again a standard protocol called ARP. Uh, what you do is so you basically flood the query to the network. The the interested node um, the response and then you have the answer. So it's sort of kind of the analogy is like, um, is anybody here named John? 
No, okay, so if I asked one of you saying, hey, I really need to get this note to John, he's in the conference somewhere, what would you, like one plausible way of doing it is going to every person in the conference saying, are you John, are you John, are you John? Eventually John is gonna say, yes, I am John. And then you are, um, then you give him the note. So we'll see a little bit of why this is uh, important. The way you grow the network, you simply add more switches, connect all of them to um, connect all of them to connect the switches together. They they, uh, they figure it out, uh, and then communication can still happen. So the question is, is is there any problem? And the answer, of course, is yes. It's a rhetorical question I asked. Uh, the, remember, the broadcasting is inherently efficient, inefficient. So when you went and asked every single person if he was John. Sort of kind of broadcasting on network is about equally annoying. So amongst other things, you spend, uh, what happened is you started spending a lot of time um, just doing the address resolution. Uh, like uh, ARP queries became very, very common. And, uh, and in general, it wasn't an ideal way of doing things. And at the same time, as these networks grew, what happened is um, this is still kind of one logical network. So what administrators started saying is, I really want this guy and this guy to be one logical unit. They, they have nothing to do with these other, other uh, nodes. So what I really want is to be able to have smaller logical networks while not having, like, not having them over the same uh, hardware infrastructure. So of course, that happened. Uh, a VLAN um, is, allows us to do exactly that. You can have multiple logical LANs sharing the physical hardware. Um, usually a VLAN is uh, a logical unit at both L2 and L3 layers, so it usually one is one subnet per VLAN. The way you do that is you, I, you basically say this is a tag, uh, this, is my, this is my identifier or some kind of name for what logical network this frame belongs to, and then the the switching infrastructure uh, uh, takes care of uh, doing the right thing. So the key fact here isn't like how do you do it, the key fact here is at this point what you're seeing is the idea of a LAN being decoupled from the physical implementation. So it's a virtual, it's a virtual implementation of an idea. So the other thing is uh, how do we then, be, but if these are logically separate networks, how do you actually communicate between them? Uh, how does, how do you do, what do you do with cross VLAN subnet traffic? And for that, you basically uh, need to go to the higher layer, usually. Uh, and the other thing which is not mentioned here is now there's an implicit control plane that is, uh, actually kind of in existence. Um, this, this only shows the, the sort of kind of data layer. So is life good now? No, again, um, this question is kind of rhetorical. So what happens is um, for large networks and in general, LANs hate loops. If you get into a loop, if you have an existence of a loop, what happens is pretty much you, your LAN melts down. So what, the, of course the switches here are smart enough to handle that and what they do is they will implicitly create one spanning tree across the, across the actual um, physical connectivity. And, uh, but the end result is even though you have multiple paths between any two nodes, only one of them will be used at any given point. So, for large networks, the other, other thing that started to become a problem is um, that one of these is, is going to end up being the root bridge. And that root bridge is on the path for all traffic that is flowing across the network. So this started to become a natural choke point. <coughs> Sorry. So how do we solve this? Again, uh, use the classic CS thing, you on the level of indirection solves everything. What you do is you start using the layer three fabric to transport L2 frames. They are 
many, many incarn not many, many, but many incarnations of this. VXLAN and VGRE are the most kind of common. And uh, the idea here is that when you see a Mac frame, uh, you take that Mac frame, put this into an IP packet, then inject it on to the onto the essentially the network between the routers. The packet travels to this other router. It takes that outer Mac frame off, looks at it, takes that IP, IP packet, looks inside it, says, oh, I need to inject it with this source and destination Mac address into this LAN, and then the packet ends up being on the other host. So at this point, it's, uh, it sounds a little bit backward because usually the what you have is L3 packets being encapsulated in L2 packets, but just essentially by taking advantage of the transport available at a higher layer, you can now have virtual LANs which actually span multiple subnets and, uh, and you get rid of the, uh, all of the inherent problems with just expanding that uh, L2 network. Again, the key point here isn't like, is this interesting technology or is very, very novel? It's not. The key point here, again, is for the same idea of a LAN, uh, there is another implementation. So even very early on, networks have started to kind of decouple the idea and the concept from the implementation. So the other kind of arc that I want to cover is what happened on the WANs. Uh, the motivating idea here is I have a multiple geographically disparate networks, so I have my branch offices all over. I want to connect them into one logical network. Um, and the other thing that usually happens is you, the addressing that you have within your network is different from the addressing that you have on the, on the internet, essentially on the, on the backbone. So if I want to send a packet from here to here, I want to use addresses that are valid only within my, my domain. Um, so one problem you immediately will face is that the addresses that you pick here are not going to have any meaning here, or they are going to have a meaning, but not the meaning you, you want. So how do we solve that? Uh, that's also pretty easy and standardized. Uh, you just create a tunnel. Um, and in a tunnel, what happens is uh, you put a packet here, However, it trans, whatever the mechanism it has for traversing the intermediate uh, network, it goes through that and it appears at the end uh, of the at the other end unchanged. So, any problems with that? By all, by all, now you all know the answer, right? I mean, yes, there are problems. So. The problem is um, this works functionally, but especially in the case of IPsec, this is this is uh, adds a lot of overhead and is usually fairly slow. It's really expensive to utilize the full bandwidth that you that you have bought. Uh, not that you can't do it; just takes deep pockets. So again, uh, there's always a solution around the corner, and what the service provider Service provider said, oh, we can help you solve that problem. So just a little bit of terminology. Um, again, apologies to networking folks. Um, you have a, a CE is a customer edge router. This is usually the edge or the gateway router at one of these places, this one. And the PE or the provider edge router is this thing here. So, so the flow is the customer's edge router connects to the provider's edge router, which then figures out how to get the packet over to uh, the other end. So the way, well, well, the solution that came up is something called VRF. And essentially what you do there is the provider edge routers are maintaining one route table per customer. So even though this is one router, it has multiple route tables active in it at the same time. So the flow is kind of fairly similar uh, as before, except with one difference. Uh, 
you, the packet goes from here to the provider edge router. Uh, then this sort of kind of puts a, there's a little bit of munging on the on the packet, uh, puts it, and this puts it on this network, which is almost which almost usually was MPLS, uh, which is another tunneling sort of kind of tunneling technology, and then you have the packet traverse to the other end. This router takes a look at uh, takes a look at the the packet, uh, decapsulates it, and then injects it at the right place. Sort of kind of a lot like the the VXLAN thing. The key idea here again is not how this technology is realized, but it's that the router at this point has become virtualized. So the concept even though logically this guy is talking to an actual router here, there are multiple routers available and running at this node. Now again, uh, in separating, the, in separating the, the concept from the implementation, um, this is not the only way of doing it. Um, in the same scenario, you don't need to have MPLS. Essentially, what you can do is, at this point, you take the IP packet, you know through your routing table you want to get it to this guy, you know his IP address within this network, you take the original IP packet, stick it into another IP packet, add this guy's IP header here, inject it into this fabric, this will end up here, you do the decapsulation, and then you can forward it. So it's, uh, it's it's basically another MPLS, and those particular uh, ideas are not the only way of doing this. Uh, and again, the key observation is, here we are only dependent on IP connectivity. So at this point, you can have a logical IP network or a logical network with completely isolated address space running over a network whose sole requirement that you have out of that is that it give you IP connectivity. So can we do this all in software? I know you're expecting me to say no, but this time, yes, you can do it. 866 is way faster now, and cap decap is relatively inexpensive, and the Linux networking stack is very flexible and robust and Curtis here can attest to that. So uh, if we do this all in software, this NCAP, DCAP, and then stick it onto the network, um, we have a logical network or an existing physical network with completely isolated address space, completely in software, and we essentially require nothing except IP connectivity from the underlay network. So to recap, Networks are way more flexible than the, they appear to apps. The functionality that is provided in the network pretty much uh, can always be done sort of kind of modulo some restrictions, but usually you can do it uh, in a way which is uh, different from the physical implementation. The interfaces are what that matter. The concepts and the interfaces matter. The implementations can keep changing just like software. And thanks to Moore's law, uh, it's possible to do quite a bit in software. And as a final bit of recap from the earlier, um, from the earlier uh, overview, the apps know the intent much better than networks. So the question would be, what does this have to do with Mesos? I mean, why are we discussing networking here? Well, in the case of a WAN, we saw that uh, we can have one logical network over an existing IP network uh, only using software and IP. Now in this case, substitute process slash container for these guys and an app group for this and the data center network for this and you have exactly the same situation in, in Mesos. So in Mesos, if for example you launch a set of applications as a service, you have containers or processes within the service they are logically, you can think of them as being one, one logical network with defined ingress and egress points and defined connectivity rules and accessibility rules running over an IP network which has been provided to them and is external. So the analogy is sort of kind of pretty, pretty tight and uh, 
can we use the same techniques to help with Mesos networking? Yes. So the question really is, if all of this is really good and really cool, um, why don't we have more dynamic networks that can be partially app specified? A few problems. Uh, first of all, the network control that you usually get from the network is not scoped. Uh, it's usually all or nothing. Yes, there are ways of constraining it, uh, but one fundamental problem that you'll always run into is a network plane only understand network entities. It doesn't really know, it can't really identify apps uh, and can't differentiate between apps. So it's really hard to scope config capabilities to the app level. Um, there are usually no uniform interfaces. There are a bunch of ways of doing this, but the, but the interfaces are, there are some standards, but by and large, uh, the space is fairly new. So the, the, the interfaces aren't really that uniform. And more importantly, some network resources are scarce and they need to be globally managed. So external IP addresses, QoS, uh, high priority, uh, bandwidth, et cetera, they all, they're all some things that need to be, some need to be arbitrated against. If every, if every app said I wanted a for traffic, um, usually the network doesn't have enough bandwidth to be able to guarantee that. So a lot of things are, nice things are possible if this happens, and then we said that there are a lot of problems with this. So, but if we could overcome those, what are some things that we could do? Um, this, is just, this is just basically, uh, you can have really robust fine-grained access control. So in app level, in app terms, you can say, I only want these things, these containers or processes to be able to talk to these and nobody else should be able to talk to them. Discovery becomes really easy. It says IP per container, but really this, you can have an address per container. You can also express things like, Whenever this entity comes up, I want you to give it a well-defined um, a, a well address which has been allocated a priori. You can have tailored QoS, so you're saying, you can say that some traffic between my, between my applications are really, really important. I want you to give them priority if you have to choose. And there are many, many more things that you can do. These are the, just the, kind of the top of the head kind of things. So again, um, Lots of nice things we can do, a uh, lot of potential problems. So what do we need? Now, if only we had an entity that sort of kind of knew all apps, managed application life cycles, was in charge of scheduling and apps uh, in orchestration, uh, knew how to do resource allocation, and presented a uniform interface to apps, and was trusted by the operator, you know, nice things could happen. Now. Does anybody, can, can anybody think of an entity that can do all of that? Yes, yes, you are all at MesosCon, so clearly the answer is yes, Mesos can do all of that. So cool, Mesos, and, you know, with, with this potential integration, you can do a lot. The question is really more practical. Can I do this today? Yes, it's, it's very nice and it's very, it sounds very nice. Uh, how do I do this? Can I do this today really? Uh, yes, there are lots of options. I mean, I'm sure I'm missing out a few. If anybody knows, just let me know, I'll update this. Uh, but there are lots and lots of ways of doing this. Uh, but from a systems guy, from thinking from a systems guy perspective, I would say, sure, you can potentially theoretically do this. These are solutions. Show me the proof. Has anybody done this? So yesterday at, uh, at the Mesos networking talk, uh, there was a demo of exactly this thing, uh, which uh, was running with, uh, was Mesos integrated with Calico. There are more coming soon. Uh, people are working on basically getting this, all of, a lot of these systems integrated with Mesos. So there are a lot of nice things, that a lot, lot of nice properties you can get if you do all of this work. It's fairly easy to do it today. Proof of concept uh, implementations exist. So what's the hitch? So as a warning, the next section is all opinions. There are a lot of networking people here. So if you don't agree with me, feel free to say this. Uh, so there are a few, in my mind, there are a few big questions that as a community we need to answer. First of all is, 
what app intents should be captured. There are some things which are pretty obvious. You want to be able to capture Ackling and reachability information from the in, intent from the apps. You want to be able to capture QoS uh, QoS uh, intent. You want to capture reachability intent. But are there any others? I'm sure there are lots and lots of things that can be captured. So, so the question really that needs to be answered is what is the what is a small enough set of core application intents? that should be captured, and the reason why this is important is because this is essentially becomes part of the interface between the Mesos system and the applications. Secondly, what should the API between Mesos and the network virtualization system look like? Just like in this case, this was the interface between the apps and the and the and Mesos, uh, this is the interface between Mesos and the underlying um, network virtualization system. Standard interfaces are critical. Uh, the, the, the closest analogy is OpenStax Neutron, although I do not think that is a very, very good idea to go exactly down that route. But more than what exactly should be there, uh, I think there needs to be a consensus around what is that standard interface so that you can have truly pluggable implementations? Third, what information should flow between Mesos and the network virtualization infrastructure and vice versa? There is a lot of information happening at the network layer that is very, very of potentially great value to Mesos and the apps, to the scheduler and the apps. Uh, and on the other hand, there's a lot of things that the higher layers know about that the network virtualization system needs to know. This is again going back to the fact that communications is a joint goal, and uh, and different parties bring different perspectives to the same to the table. Other open questions: How should the responsibilities be divided for this task amongst the Mesos components? So. What should the master do? Arbit just arbitrate global resources, do something else. Um, some things, again, some things there's pretty good consensus on, other things not that much. For the agent, what should it do? Does it have any role to play? Arguably, yes, but again, not sure. Frameworks, uh, what part do frameworks play in it? Do you even have to have these two involved? Can you just do it at the framework level? Yes, you can. The question is, should you? Is there anything else that needs any component or any other abstraction that needs to be added to the Mesos component stack to be able to do a really good job in this space? How should schedulable network resources be handled? Uh, there's some very early work in the global resource scheduling in Mesos. This is a pretty sparse doc at the moment, and this is the only thing I could find. So it's it's work in pretty early stages, which is good because that's a point, that's a chance to kind of influence the work and get it in the right place. And very importantly, something which is usually forgotten is how do we express and integrate operator policies into this system? So at the end of the day, it's the operator who is running the infrastructure, and they usually want to have a lot of say in what's happening. So you can think of things like, I want to be able to say as an organization policy that things running in my dev cluster shouldn't be able to connect to my prod cluster. Or if you're traversing this link, then you, sh then you need to encrypt. So there's a lot of... Um, then there needs to be an explicit way of being able to take those operator policies and plug them in. So in conclusion, um, integration of network virtualization with Mesos has tremendous potential. There's a lot of very cool things that you can do. More importantly, there are a lot of unanswered questions. And at this point, we really need the Mesos community to weigh in, discuss, answer those questions, and start the process uh, on a really good foundation. Um, so again, stressing this, I can't stress this enough, this thing needs to happen. There needs to be a lot of discussion. All of the people, like a lot of the interested people need to get together in one room, maybe virtually, 
over a network and say, okay, what is it that we need? How do we answer those questions? Are there any more questions that need to be answered? So that we can take the full, we can take this effort to its logical conclusion. So that's the end of the talk. Um, if you're interested in this, there's a lot of communication starting to happen. Feel free to reach out to me or on the mailing list, however. But the, the key point, apart from the key point of this whole talk is the, the communication needs to start happening. There's a lot of implementation starting to happen. There's a lot of uh, kind of uh, cooperation that is starting to happen. And uh, as a community, we need to get together and take this in the right direction. Cool. That's all. Questions? Yes. Uh, no, that is, uh, as far as I know, that is the global global resource allocation doc. Uh, it does have a tiny bit of a section around saying one of the things that are global are IP addresses, external IP addresses, but it's, it's not filled in. There is a JIRA, there are two linked JIRAs that go in that direction. Uh, cool. Yes. I purposely did not mention SDNs because you can do again. You can do all of all of this, all of all of, all that was mentioned using SDNs. Um, but SDNs have a lot of different meaning to a lot of different people at this point. Um, so that's why I explicitly did not say you can you can't like you should use software defined networks at some level. Um, if you take away the, the, the fact, or you take away the, the requirement that uh, future network state be a function of current aggregated network state, um, and that is computed by a logical controller, uh, that's what you, if you take that part out, the centralized control and, and this coordination is, is really um, present in all of those, most, most of those network visualization systems. So that's why I specifically didn't include SDNs because they have a, a lot of they have a different meaning to a, to a lot of different people but yes you you, you you just you don't need to just use a, one of these network virtualization systems any anything that allows you to kind of do those kinds of things um, will work any other questions yes Um, I'll try and paraphrase that question. Your question is, how does this, how would this, is your question, how would this work with existing SDN implementations? Or is it, your question, how would this work with just existing network infrastructure? So thought, what's the extent to which we want to control the I don't have a very good answer. That's exactly the question that we need to answer. But if I had to take a guess, it would be that you would, just like the apps give, would give, express their intent, and for two mesos to be realized, at the end of the day, mesos would take that app content, maybe app intent, merge it with other things, and then express it over a, over a standardized API to the network infrastructure to be realized. Uh, yes. Okay, so Spike agrees. Uh, sorry, Curtis, right? No, Spike. Spike, yes. Uh, so Spike agrees. But again, the the point isn't is this is this the way it should go. The point is this is this is one opinion in the way it should go. We really need to come together and get to a, get to a consensus and make sure all viewpoints are being considered in this in this question. Yes. Yes. Uh, if you, this is, a, if you go here, that's a working demo. I think Wipin has something um, which is about, which is 
uh, two weeks out? The other work, sorry, go ahead. I'm not sure you should actually differentiate between those two because the Asian controller's job is to basically configure the network. So, um, yeah, so maybe I'm missing something. Again, I'm not a networking guy, these people are. Uh, so, um, one more, uh, so there's stuff that Vipin is doing, there's stuff that uh, Sanju, and, uh, Sanju and others are doing at uh, Juniper. So there's a lot of stuff starting to happen, and unless we all come together, again, my key point is unless we all come together and get to a good point, it's gonna be, everyone is gonna be at cross purposes, and we are gonna have really, really narrowly defined solutions and APIs. Any other questions? No? Cool, thank you. <laughs>